This is the Fifth Estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you may have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 1st of July 2021 and I am 2J. I am 2 I am CS. In case you missed today's headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, Uhuru Raila final plea. In the Standard, we aren't promoters of BBI, Uhuru Raila. And in the Star, 3.7 billion shilling school cash scam rocks Magoha ministry. Mm. So, Turam, I have a feeling we're not going to address any of the headlines today. Zero. Right? So what do you want to tell us? <laughs> now, this Thursday, we will throw a question to Kikuiz. What if Ruto is Moi 2.0? Uh -huh. And we ask this because Professor Mutai Ngoni always tells us that in the Moi School of Politics, Ruto was a boarding student, Uhuru was a night school student, and Museveni Salva Kir and the late John Garang attended the Moi School through correspondence. <laughs> 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 now, if this is true, then it means that Ruto, as a boarding student, has a Moi cookbook of politics under his bed. Mm -hmm. His cookbook taught us a few lessons. One, they must never see you coming. Mm. Now, in 1978, Kikuyus never saw Moi coming. In fact, they voted for him in 1979 and they even gave him a deputy in the name of Moi Kibaki. Yes. They supported Moi financially, knowing well that he would protect them. Uh, but guess what? In just three years, Moi clamped down on them hard. All right? Now, banks, industries, and businesses owned by Gemma's wealthy went under. Mm -hmm. They which took their money to foreign accounts in Switzerland, invested abroad to avoid being targeted. Kikuyus with land in the Rift Valley were targeted every election cycle, with hundreds dying and many others evicted from their homes. And that's because the government of the day then knew that only the only way to cripple Gemma was to nyonga their money and their wealth. Mm -hmm. And remember, Moi's vice president was Moi Kibaki, but the man couldn't help. Now, Kikuyus have been blinded by Wilbarus, <laughs> Bona Asifiwe rhetoric, uh, and Pesanane, and, and chicken. And, and they have been told they will never, I mean, they will be made wealthier by Ruto. Mm. They have been told they will have a strong deputy president who will take care of their interests. They forget that Ruto was a border in the Moi School of Politics. Yes. The question to Kikuyus is therefore this. If you suffered under Moi, and Ruto is Moi's student, what makes you think you will not suffer under Ruto? Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting take. <laughs> so I want to take a moment to look uh, beyond the headlines, just as 2M did, maybe just not as extreme. So we've said repeatedly on the Fifth Estate that the media is either lazy or evil, and oftentimes they are both. Lazy because they don't do due diligence when reporting the news, evil because they profit off selling negativity, and oftentimes both because they have no interest in telling stories that inspire country. So today, I want to inspire the country. And I will do so by focusing on the big picture matters that are happening in Kenya and are being spearheaded by Uhuru Kenyatta. Yes. Mm -hmm. A few months ago, when President Suluhu made her first state visit to Kenya, mm. I said that Uhuru Kenyatta was teaching us the art of diplomacy. Yes. This man has extended an arm and collaborated with so many leaders across Africa. Mm. Why? Because he is focused on pursuing a win-win strategy at home and abroad. BBI is focused on political inclusion at home, but meeting with the United Kingdom, DRC, and Tanzania are all about big picture. We are speaking of connecting Tanzanian and Congolese products to Mombasa and the world. Yes. And at the same time, ensuring that free trade in the region is sustainable. Yes. So all of this took part in the first half yes. of 2021. Correct. And I want to continue highlighting Uhuru's big picture agenda as we head into the last six months of the year. Yeah. The president recently visited Turkey, was received by the King of Brussels, and today, he jetted off to France to meet President Macron. Yeah. Fellow Kenyans, do you know what is happening? How are you? Kenya recently signed a 100 billion shilling trade deal with Turkey. Oh. And Uhuru made that visit yeah. to solidify the ties that bond our two nations. Yeah. Did you know that trade with Turkey increased from 4.1 billion shillings in 2009 
to 14.9 billion in 2015. That is an increase of 263% in just seven years. Nabado. In Brussels, yeah. the focus was on promoting EU Africa trade in order to give our continent more bargaining power. Yeah. And this current trip to France is set to seal the deal for a 233 kilometer road from Nairobi to Mao Summit. Oh my goodness. Now this, this is the news that the dailies want to keep from you. That your president is at work. Yes. Ensuring that every farmer, hawker, mamamboga, and small business owner has access to local, mm -hmm. regional, and international markets. Yes. This is what economic acceleration is all about. Yes. This is beyond 2022 or even 2030. Yes. Mm -hmm. For me, this is the future. Preach. Thank Woo. you. I'm done. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful. And you know what, uh, Tujay? These fellows and these fellows called Kikuyus, them just go on CS. They can sit on a pin, I think is what you're trying to say. Actually, I was going to tell them once. <laughs> <laughs> In keeping with the theme, looking at today's papers, I'm frankly surprised at how fast they have moved on from the President's 16th COVID address. Mm. And yet, there's so much to unpack from it. Mm. Two issues which stood out, for example, include <coughs> his response to emerging problems posed by vaccine nationalism, mm. as well as to the challenge posed by those who would seek immoral profits in an in unprecedented season of human suffering. Mm. With respect to vaccine nationalism, the World Health Organization director warned in January of this year that vaccine nationalism would risk prolonging the pandemic and that it exposed and exploited the inequalities of our world. Yes. Vaccine nationalism emerged as a result of vaccines being hoarded by nations with the capacity to develop them for the benefit of their own citizens, mm -hmm. while the world's least developed nations only waited and watched. Mm -hmm. But what the president's speech highlighted on Tuesday, and we note this with emphasis, is that he rejected the notion that Kenya would also wait and watch. Yes, yeah. And now, just well over a year after the pandemic gripped our nation, the government policy as articulated by the president is that 10 million Kenyans will be vaccinated by Christmas and the entire adult population will be vaccinated by mid-June next year. Add to that the fact that he has insulated, uh, instituted plans to make the logistics of distribution efficient, plans to educate the public on vaccination, mm -hmm. and plans to establish a human vaccine development center to study this virus and to better prepare for future outbreaks. While many people insistently castigated him for the impossible dilemma of whether to lock down or open up and berated him constantly for how he delicately handled the polarizing tension of having to choose between Kenyan lives and Kenyan livelihoods, mm -hmm. the president remained focused. And now the fruits of his quiet toil are manifestly apparent. Mm -hmm. While others politicked and taunted him to focus on COVID instead of BBI, it is apparent that they were clueless as to the fact that they were dealing with a man with a plan and quiet determination. Yes. And it is ironic because some of these people are famous for often saying that we can chew gum and climb stairs at the same time. Yes. <laughs> well, the president just reminded you that it is possible to conduct more than one program at the same time. Mm. What a ceremony in Oh, yes. But also, in keeping with the president's policy initi initiatives, which are aimed at restoration of human dignity, the president has made it clear that the vaccine will be free to all Kenyans. Mm -hmm. This highlights the president's stand on moral imperatives, that people should not be raking in abnormal profits on the back of mass human suffering. Indeed. It also exposes the contradictions of those who earlier in the year criticized and taunted the president for banning expensive vaccines. Mm -hmm. Their money-minded reasoning being simply, let those who can afford it pay for it. Mm -hmm. The private sector to roll out let Kenyans who can afford to pay, pay. Let those who cannot afford, uh, we, should, we should even bring it to Nyayo Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, we at the Fort Hall School of Government have come to the conclusion that the President's speech is yet another reminder that in this season of our politics, we are faced with two very different visions of leadership. Mm. And only one of them is truly interested and genuinely invested in uplifting all Kenyans. The evidence in this regard is increasingly abundant. Let, let, let me help you, CS. 
<laughs> Those people you're talking about are called Hasura Nisha. Mm, no, but it's actually a really good point that you've kind of lit in my head. Yeah. The fact that those who wanted to pay for Sputnik and did so illegally, we yeah. might say, yeah. Yeah. you know, at the cost of the average Kenyan who couldn't afford to do the same. Yeah. The president is reaffirming that all Kenyans are yes. one and the same. Absolutely. We go through it together, we suffer together, we, you know, we um, have success together. Yeah. Those who took Sputnik, yes. shame on you. I hope Putin put something in there. <laughs> anyway, and so, said I was extreme. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a three-part criteria that we use to judge the headlines by. We ask ourselves, is the headline topical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking, and thoughtful or just plain lazy? I don't even think we have to go through the headlines again. I think we've all agreed all of them that they fail across the board. Yes. We're not going to discuss any of them, and so we toss, toss all three. Yeah. I think the winning headline is June's comment on Putin. Oh gosh, <laughs> we have no winning headline. <laughs> and now our final thought. It is inspired by a book entitled So You've Been Publicly Shamed mm. by John Ronson. Yes, this was an exciting read. Yeah. So what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase public shaming? Mm. For me, I think about the practice that was common during the Middle Ages with a device called a pillory. I think you remember it. It's that hinged wooden frame where the victim had their head and hands secured on while they were shamed on public. Uh, often they had rotten fruits that were thrown at them. And in the Bible, we have floggings that were made public for physical and maximum humiliation. So this is mostly gone from society. But today we are living through what the author calls a great renaissance of public shaming. Mm. So this book explores that re-emergence of public shaming as an internet phenomenon, particularly on Twitter. So in gathering the material for this book, Ronson interviewed several ind uh, individuals who were on the receiving end of um, concentrated internet shaming. Mm. And one of the first people that he interviews is a woman by the, la uh, a woman by the name of Justine Sacco. Mm. So at the time, she was a public relations executive who just before boarding a flight from London to South Africa tweeted the following. Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this tweet was, was spotted by a journalist who then wrote an article about it that then began to spark international outrage. But the problem was that Sacco was still in the air and she was offline. She was unable to delete this tiny piece of media that had become Twitter's obsession. By the time she landed in South Africa, 11 hours later, she was the most talked about subject on the internet. Since her tweet blew up, her name was tweeted more than 30,000 times and the hashtag almost 100,000 times. Four days later, her employer announced that they had decided to part ways with her. Friends, coworkers, and even family abandoned her. And without her job and in the spotlight, she fell into a depression. And in her own words, she says, to me, it was so insane of a comment for anyone to make. I thought that there was no way anyone could possibly think it was literal. But this is what public shaming or cancel culture does. It can turn the internet into a uniquely unfiltered place where people online feel relatively anonymous. They don't feel bound by you know, the norms about their behavior, and they feel empowered to make offensive remarks, believing that they will be consequence free. And so the author, he says, he's not interested in only what shaming does to the shamey, Sacco in this case, mm. but also to the shamer. Mm. And the answer, he says, is nothing good. Public shaming, in other words, diminishes everybody involved. I will say that it was a funny story. It was a funny story. <laughs> yeah. But I think she kind of deserved it. Really? <laughs> I mean, it was funny. I mean, yeah, it was funny. I mean, if you have a head on your shoulders, you know it was a joke. Yeah. But if 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 I saw that tweet, the first thing I'll do is laugh. laugh I, will, I, will, yeah. I will not get offended. But <laughs> anyway, she kind of deserved it. <laughs> anyway, social media is one dangerous place for people with fragile minds. Mm -hmm. And my advice to you out there that loves documenting life out there in their social space, beware of those you call friends or followers. They just may be your biggest downfall. In fact, your best bet is uh, your, your best bet is street adulation mm. with the greatest contempt, and yes. this is advice to only those 
who mean well. To the rest of you, you can get lost. <laughs> anyway, a sad story here. In 2012, Lindsay Stone, or Lindsay Stone, did something that appeared incredibly stupid. See, Lindsay Stone was a social worker who worked with adults with learning disabilities, like to uh, pose for dangerous, I mean outrageous, silly photos, like the one of her smoking in front of a non-smoking sign. Mm. One day, her friend shared a picture on Facebook of Lindsay holding up a, a body and mm -hmm. pretending to scream while standing in front of a sign that read silence and respect. Mm. The sign was posted in Arlington National Cemetery. Lindsay's photo soon went viral and her reputation went with it. The context here was that Lindsay showed a great deal of disrespect to the American military at the Arlington Cemetery in Virginia uh, where over 400,000 US soldiers were buried. Mm. Uh, she claimed afterwards she intended, uh, she intended it as a joke. Almost everyone else found it offensive, and quickly the image went viral. Stone was inundated with outraged emails, Facebook messages, mm -hmm. and phone calls, some of which included death threats, and so was her company. She was fired from her job and left to pick up the pieces of her life. But uh, Lindsay was done. You could tell she did not mean bad, Mm. I mean, she worked with people who had learning disabilities. It wasn't in her to do silly stuff, but in the end, the fickle world of social media crucified her. Mm. Such a shame how extreme people go, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. But if, if you have a fickle mind, if, you, if your mind is weak and that, that, you know, doesn't take criticism well. You're not made for social you're media. You're not made for social yeah. media. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. I'd like to go into the psychology of it a little bit. There's a section in the final chapter of the book where the author John Ronson recalls a conversation he had with a journalist friend of his who shared his apprehension about negative feedback on social media. Mm -hmm. So much so that despite the fact that he had so many jokes, uh, little observations he had made, and potentially even risque thoughts, he wouldn't dare post them anymore. Mm. <laughs> he said that, I suddenly feel with social media like I'm tiptoeing around an unpredictable, angry, unbalanced parent <laughs> who might strike out at any moment, and it's horrible. Mm. This reminded me of a recent piece by Chimamanda Adeshie titled It's Obscene, A True Reflection in Three Parts, where she highlighted that there are many social media savvy people who are choking on sanctimony and lacking in compassion, mm. who can fluidly pontificate on Twitter about kindness but are unable to actually show kindness. Yeah. People whose social media lives are case studies in emotional aridity. John Ronson partly attributes this to feedback loops which are a profoundly effective tool for changing behavior, even though this can end up changing behavior either in a good way or in a bad way. Mm. Feedback loops occur when you exhibit some type of behavior and you get instant real-time feedback <laughs> for it, and then you decide whether or not to change your behavior as a result of the feedback. Mm. But you get instant feedback for that decision too. What John Ronson, however, observes about feedback loops in the context of social media is that in some ways feedback loops are leading to our world we only think we want. This is because they are turning social media into a giant echo chamber mm. where what we believe is constantly reinforced by people who believe the same thing. <laughs> we express our opinion, we are instantly congratulated for this, we make the on-spot decision to carry on believing it and thus echo chamber of expression is hailed as a new form of democracy. In reality however, it is the opposite because it locks people of, off in the world they started with and prevents them from finding out anything different. Mm. They get trapped in the system of feedback reinforcement. The idea that there's another world of people out there who have other ideas becomes marginalized. Mm. In similar vein, Chimamanda writes in her essay that we now have a generation of young people on social media so terrified of having the wrong opinions that they have robbed themselves of the opportunity to think mm. and to learn and to grow. Absolutely. The assumption of good faith is dead. What matters is not goodness, but the appearance of goodness. <laughs> we are no longer human beings. We are now angels jostling to out-angel one another. Yeah. The final observation John Ronson makes in the book is quite powerful. He writes that we are defining the boundaries of normalcy by tearing apart people outside of it. We see ourselves as non-conformist, but I think all of this is creating a more conformist conservative age. Mm, yeah, I think it's something about that dopamine that you get 
not mm. only from notifications, but from people interacting with you online. Mm. It's a mm. kind of like a high mm. that you get, as you're saying, from people confirming or agreeing with the views that you have. Oh yeah, Is it a good thing? I don't know. Yeah. So on a day when we had no winning headline, I want to leave you with this. It is an unwritten rule that human beings must be tormented throughout their lives in one way or another. If you are fortunate enough to have risen to a social level where no one does it for you for free, then you must pay for that service. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what being on social media is all about. We're actually paying for torment, <laughs> right? <laughs> so thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on TV. We're on Pang, Free to Air, Go TV, and Star Times. Have a lovely evening. We'll see you tomorrow.